Hello everyone, Steve Zuckerman in Baton Rouge and mercifully for all involved this will be our last lecture about the neurological manifestations or complications of systemic disease. Now we're going to divide this talk into acute and chronic liver failure and uh, this is a slide depicting some of the more common causes of acute liver failure. Of course, not going to be required to know this for your neurology examinations, but maybe it's good to know it to show off to your internal medicine colleagues and or attendings. The most common cause far and away is acetaminophen, overdose, other medications are commonly associated with liver insufficiency, uh, rifampicin, isoniazid, sodium valproate, amiodarone, and sulfonamides. And finally, of course, there are the infectious causes, namely the viral hepatitides. When I was training, we had hepatitis B. Now apparently there's a hepatitis A through E. Who knows how many times we're going to go through the alphabet before this is all over. Other common viruses are going to be CMV virus, HSV virus, EBV virus, etc., etc. Now, of course, this list doesn't include other major categories such as inborn error of metabolism, i.e., Wilson's disease, or primary hepatic uh, diseases such as primary bilirubin cirrhosis, so we won't mention those. So the pathophysiology of hepatic encephalopathy from acute liver failure is actually kind of interesting in a sort of geeky kind of way. It's sort of cool to note that dietary glutamine is usually converted to glutamate to become a neurotransmitter and ammonia and the ammonia gets metabolized in the liver to urea and so in times of hepatic insufficiency there is an accumulation of ammonia and glutamine which are uh, toxic to the brain. They can cause astrocyte swelling and therefore slowing down of transmission of neural signals. Furthermore, the neurotransmitter ratio of excitatory to inhibitory is inversed or actually reversed such that there is greater neuroinhibitory signals that um, dominate. Cytokines are released which can be cytotoxic. There is activation of oxidative stress pathways, also impairment of mitochondrial function, and finally it's good to keep in mind that with hepatic insufficiency a coagulopathy results and therefore intracranial bleeding is also a possible mechanism of neurological deterioration. So of course there is a criteria for establishing the severity of the encephalopathy that's called the West Haven criteria. I don't know which West Haven this refers to, maybe the one in Connecticut. In any case, stage zero is asymptomatic and only detectable on neuropsychological testing, whereas stage one, there is some mild impairment with some decreased attention span, difficulty with concentration, problems with calculation or problem solving, typical sort of medical student after a night on call, whereas stage two would indicate somebody who's actually lethargic and disoriented, they may have some inappropriate behavior, and they will demonstrate some dysarthria, perhaps, and they will definitely have moderate amount of asterixis, as opposed to stage three, where they will have marked asterixis, they'll be somnolent but rousable, they will be markedly disoriented, perhaps have bizarre behavior, and in fact have increased motor tone with spasticity, increased reflexes, 
etc. And finally, stage four would be uh, someone in a coma with decerebrate prostering and possibly seizures. So uh, if you look at two, three, and four, um, those are the classical levels of consciousness from a Posner with lethargy, stupor, coma. So uh, that gives some sort of framework, so it makes it easier to remember. So the principles of managing the encephalopathy associated with acute liver failure have to do with obviously basic supportive medical care, including intensive care unit monitoring of hemodynamics and respiratory function, presumably with uh, intubation, and the uh, very careful management of the intracranial pressure to lower it by means of elevating the bed 30 degrees using either mannitol as your osmotic diuretic or perhaps um, being careful to keep the serum sodium between 145 and 155 perhaps by means of using hypertonic saline and more recently it's been shown that uh, carefully inducing hypothermia has benefit in reducing intracranial pressure as well. Early on in the course, it's useful to use N-acetylcysteine, which has been proven to improve the coagulopathy and survival. So the neurological complications of chronic liver failure are actually somewhat different, but overlapping with those of acute liver failure. Uh, most notably, the encephalopathy that one sees with chronic hepatic disease is actually fairly mild. However, there is a chronic decline in cognitive functioning overall. In addition, there are other neurological potential manifestations, including a cerebellar syndrome, perhaps extrapyramidal signs will develop, and uh, a myelopathy can ensue as well as a neuropathy and we'll mention that a little bit later with more details. The medical management of chronic liver failure is actually very distinct from that of acute liver failure. In both cases, however, any uh, systemic or medical factors which may be contributing to the hepatic encephalopathy should be considered and removed and those include GI bleeding, the use of any sedative medications, hyponatremia, sepsis, and dehydration can all exacerbate the underlying hepatic uh, encephalopathy. Uh, there are four proven interventions that are helpful, the use of probiotics, the use of low-dose lactulose, i.e. only 30 to 60 milligrams a day, using an antibiotic, Rifaximin, 500 milligrams BID, 550 milligrams BID, and nutritional supplements with the use of branched chain amino acids have all been shown to be effective. Now, the myelopathy that I mentioned previously um, is a rare complication of the portosystemic shunting that one sees in cirrhosis or chronic uh, hepatic disease and it is a very severe problem causing a spastic paraparesis. One of the thing, one of the ways to distinguish it from other causes of myelopathy is that you won't find sensory involvement, therefore there won't be a spinal cord level, nor will there be any sphincter involvement. However, it uh, is certainly a diagnosis of exclusion, so you need to run all of the tests that you would for other causes of myelopathies, notably uh, imaging procedures, MRI scan in hepatic causes of myelopathy, may be normal or may show evidence of areas of demyelination. Spinal fluid is usually normal. Um, the pathology, which hopefully won't get to that point, but it does show that there is demyelination of a lot of lateral cortical spinal tracts, and the only known treatment for this would be liver transplantation. Now, unlike the myelopathy seen with chronic liver failure, 
the neuropathy associated is actually common with at least 50% of people who have chronic liver disease showing evidence for a peripheral neuropathy. Now this is independent of whatever the cause of the liver failure is, so it shouldn't be concluded that the neuropathy is uh, related to any particular cause, such as alcoholism or nutritional deficiencies. Um, it's very common, 30 to 50 percent of people with hepatic insufficiency chronically will develop autonomic nervous system involvement, and the neuropathy is a typical axonal type sensory motor neuropathy, similar to the one that one sees in diabetes. And again, the only known treatment for this would be liver transplantation.